Good morning. Let us pray, please. Father, as we pause this morning, we give you thanks. We thank you for this beautiful day and for the opportunity you give us to be part of it. Father, we thank you for all the great gifts you give us because we know that all good and perfect gifts come from you. Father, we pray for all those that need you in a special way, those that are lost loved ones, those that are in the hospitals and the nursing homes. Father, we pray now that you will go with us through this hour, be with John as he brings your message to us. And Father, we thank you for the greatest gift of all, and that's the gift of your Son and our Savior, Jesus Christ, in whose name I pray. Amen. Please stand as we sing our hymn of praise, Come All Christians Be Committed, number 604. by passing the peace of Christ. Good morning and welcome. Beautiful day to be out and about and going to be a beautiful week apparently in central Kentucky. We welcome you if you're visiting with us. We're glad to have you in worship. We hope you'll fill out a visitor's card if you find one there in the bench in front of you. And we hope that you will invite someone 
to come and visit next week if you're a member at First Baptist Church. Notice we are receiving our World Hunger Offering. You can note uh, in your gift uh, what channel you want to channel it through, the Cooperative Baptist Fellowship or the Southern Baptist Convention. Note also the WMU Banquet on October the 27th. I think that's a Tuesday night, isn't it, Francis? And there'll be a good speaker there on disaster relief. We need you to sign up out here if you're going to go so we can prepare a meal for you. We continue in our outreach ministry on Wednesdays, this past Wednesday night. Note the folks there that participated. I think there's a typo in there. Instead of Ben Whitaker, I believe Bev Allen was, was supposed to have been typed in there. So that's a, that's a typo. Don't know how that happened, but it was brought to my attention this morning. The Sanctuary Choir continues to rehearse for the Christmas cantata, which is planned for December the 13th on Sunday morning. Still receiving new folks to, right. to come and rehearse. Notice the Thanksgiving dinner and the concert group that will be singing there on the Sunday before Thanksgiving Day. Are there other announcements? Anyone? If not, may we continue in our worship by singing our offertory hymn, number 293, Jesus Calls Us, or the Tumult. May we stand as we sing. John Ballard, would you lead us in our offertory prayer, please? Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for this beautiful day to allow us to come to your house and worship you. Thank you for all the many blessings that you give each and every, every one of us. Help us to repay some of those back in these tithes today with an open heart. Be with all of our armed forces overseas or wherever they are in the world. Protect them and keep them out of harm's way. Forgive us when we fail you, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. On our prayer list, we have several listed there. We're glad to report that Virginia Blanton has come home from the hospital. 
actually on Friday after this bulletin was printed. Uh, Patricia Henry, Don Henry's niece, is in Cardinal Hill where she was moved from UK Hospital also on Friday. We remember Zella Saylor and Ben Swanner, Elizabeth Spa in retirement homes, and others that are listed there. Uh, please keep them in your prayers and help us keep this list uh, current by contacting the church office. Our scripture today comes early in the Gospel of John during the ministry of John the Baptist, who was the forerunner of Jesus. John had his own cadre of disciples who followed him, and his role, which he accepted, was that he might decrease and Christ might increase, and he channeled his followers toward Jesus. We take up in verse 35 of chapter 1. The next day again, John was standing with two of his disciples and he looked at Jesus as he walked by and said, Behold the Lamb of God. The two disciples heard him say this, and they followed Jesus. Jesus turned and saw them following and said to them, What do you seek? And they said to him, Rabbi, which means teacher, where are you staying? And he said to them, Come and see, come and see. And they came and saw where he was staying, and they stayed with him that day, for it was about the tenth hour, which means it was about four or five o'clock, the day far spent. One of the two who heard John speak and followed him was Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. He first found his brother Simon and said to him, we have found the Messiah, which means Christ. And then he brought him to Jesus, and Jesus looked at him and said, So you are Simon, son of John. That's how people were known, son of, daughter of. So you're Simon, Barjona, son of John. Your name shall be Cephas, which means Peter. Aramaic for rock. May God bless this reading of his word as we pray together. Almighty God, we identify ourselves in this gathering this morning as Christian in that we have come in the name of Jesus Christ, believing that you are present with us because we are gathered and because we are gathered in Jesus' name. May we not miss your presence, O oh God. May we not ignore your teachings, your word. May we not be unresponsive when we leave, but take whatever gospel truth, whatever spiritual insight gleaned from your holy word into the world in which we live. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
Amen. Thank you. Our character for today is the same guy that we talked about last Sunday. Do you remember who he was? He's only named a few times in the New Testament. He's kind of a behind-the-scenes disciple. Remember him? His name's Andrew. And I decided to follow up on that by tracing Andrew a little further in the Scripture, and I had to go all the way back to the first chapter of John's Gospel. Even before Jesus is the central character of John's Gospel, it's John the Baptist early on. And Andrew is already in the picture following John the Baptist. Andrew is, is not well known. He's not in the inner circle, Peter, James, and John. He is not a star actor in the drama of the gospel. In fact, when he's named, he is usually called Simon Peter's brother. <laughs> Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. I was walking through Walmart the other day in a pretty little blonde girl ran up to me, looked like she was about eight years old, and she said, you're Grace's daddy, aren't you? <laughs> yes, I am. Well, I'm in her class at school, and we miss her, and somehow she associated me. She'd seen me with Grace, and well, who are you? What's your name? She said, I'm Emily, and uh, she knows two Emilys, Emily. And this little Emily knows me as Grace's daddy. Um, I remember being Frank Owen's son. I remember being Frank Owen Jr.'s little brother. He was 6'6 six, six and stood and weighed 265 pounds and played for Henry Clay High School. And when I went out for the team, I was Frankie's little brother. So Andrew is Simon Peter's brother. Um, but in the message today, I just want him to be Andrew a person of his own right. Because in part, Andrew, not being a superstar, is kind of a more attainable pattern for me and maybe for all of us. We can't all be the Apostle Paul or the Apostle John or Peter, but maybe we can be Andrews. He's a little bit like Barnabas. He's a he, he plays a secondary and supportive role. Hollywood over the years developed uh, the supporting role. They give the Oscars to the best supporting actor um, as well as to the main star uh, because supporting actors and secondary figures often make great things happen and without them they wouldn't happen at all. How many of you can name the quarterback of Kentucky's football team? Larry, who's the quarterback? Tolles. What's his first name? Patrick Tolles. How many of you knew that? How many of you can name the center who snaps the ball every play? Two of you raised your hand. How many of you can name the right guard, the left tackle, the right tackle? Larry, you, are, you and your dad were great, are great exceptions. <laughs> what about the kickoff team? Can you name the guys that line up on the special team? You get the point. But you take them off the field. You take those linemen that block for Patrick Tolles off the field, and he couldn't do anything, could he? He would be mush, supporting roles. Don't get the headlines. They're not usually in the newspaper. Uh, if you look back on NBA history or college history and the great individual players and the statistics, you're also a stats man, Larry. If you go back far enough, you'll find that they didn't even list assists for many years. We, we don't really know who the greatest assist. John Stockton, I think, holds the record. Did, some, did Steve Nash pass him? I don't remember. But they now log assists. The guy that passes the ball to the person that makes the basket 
is in many respects more important. They asked Wilt Chamberlain one time when he was living, I saw it on television, they were interviewing him. He said, if you were going to put together an all-time great first five NBA basketball team, who would be your first player that you would pick around whom you would build the team? Anybody see that interview? Wilt Chamberlain at one time was listed, if you, could, if you knew Ripley's, uh, not Ripley's, Guinness Book of Records, and list the top five NBA scoring averages. The top five, can you name them? They were Wilt Chamberlain, Wilt Chamberlain, Wilt Chamberlain, Wilt Chamberlain, Wilt Chamberlain. And Oscar Robertson came, I heard you say Oscar. Who's the only person ever to average a triple-double in the NBA for an entire season? Oscar Robertson. Now if somebody gets a triple-double in one game, Larry, it's a big deal. Imagine averaging a triple-double. But you know somebody threw him the ball to get his points. The secondary roles, the supporting figures are so often overlooked, but without them we wouldn't have anything. Andrew, the behind-the-scenes disciple, he's our star today. Andrew is attainable. Andrew is the kind of disciple that great churches are made of. The people who do the legwork. Eddie Wolf was a member of my first church, Gumlick Baptist Church, up near the Pendleton County, Grant County line. That little church is still there. And Eddie couldn't read. I don't know, he probably couldn't write, but he came to me when I started there and said, Pastor, don't call on me to pray. <laughs> he got to me the first Sunday. Don't call on me to pray in public. Don't ask me to teach a Sunday school class. But if you ever need anything done around the church, something fixed, something maintained, something painted, call me. He dug the graves by hand while I was a pastor there, and he kept the place going. He fired the little little pot-bellied stove in the middle of the sanctuary, which is the only room the church had, every morning early and had it warm when we got there. Secondary roles, Andrews. I want to follow Andrew through the New Testament, through John's Gospel, and it won't be many places that he appears, but the first one, as we've read this morning, is early in the ministry of Jesus, even before the ministry of Jesus began. He's following John the Baptist, and John the Baptist looks at Jesus and says, there's the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And Andrew trotted off and followed Jesus immediately. Now, there's something good to be said of John the Baptist, that he was willing to give up his own following and channel his followers, and he was a star, to Jesus and take a second-rate position. He must increase and I must decrease. And maybe Andrew had gotten that message from John the Baptist, having been one of his disciples, because Andrew did not have to be a star. And what's the first thing Andrew did? The text says he went and found his brother Simon, and he brought him to Jesus. He brought a better man than himself in many respects, at least maybe in the department of talent a man who did become a star met Jesus because of Andrew. We've all heard of Billy Graham and Billy Sunday. We've heard of Martin Luther and John Wesley. Who led them to Christ? Do you know who led them to Christ? Maybe if you've read a little bit of church history, you know some of that. But the people that led them to Christ, who led you to Christ? Who is your Andrew? To whom are you, Andrew, doing behind-the-scenes legwork to lead them to Christ? The first thing Andrew did when he met Christ was, was to go and find his brother Andrew and establish that personal touch. He didn't send him a letter in the mail. He didn't email him. He didn't refer him to a website. He didn't call him on his cell phone. He didn't text him. And I do all of that, and you do too probably. 
But that's not the personal touch we find in the gospel. You can't email people into the kingdom of God. I wish you could. It, it, it requires getting acquainted, face-to-face -face encounter. We read and we observe ourselves. Go to a restaurant and find people sitting there, especially young people, across the table from each other, like this. Texting one another sometimes in the same rest, at the same table. Checking out the internet, surfing the web, and losing the ability to have personal encounters with one another. Isn't it nice when you call somebody, your credit card company, your bank, and you get a real live individual on the phone? You don't go through a, a bunch of dial this and that and the other and get voicemail and recordings. Isn't it nice to, to walk in the bank and go face to face with a teller across the counter? Now and then, just for the novelty of it. I saw, a, I saw a novel thing the other day. I saw somebody driving through an intersection with both hands on the steering wheel without a cell phone in front of them. Personal touch. He went and, and he got hold of Peter. You know, he shook his hand. He made contact. That's the best form of outreach, isn't it, Mary? Making personal contact. Our world is growing increasingly impersonal, and it's a sad thing. And I wonder if there's a direct correspondence with the polarization of our country and the world and the increasingly depersonalization of our lifestyles. It's amazing if you get acquainted with somebody with whom you may disagree politically or even religiously that if you sit down over a cup of coffee, and get acquainted, you might realize, you know what? He or she has red blood in their, you know, in their veins just like I do. We're both human beings, and maybe we're more compatible than we realized. Oh, may our country learn that lesson politically soon. Amen? The second thing that Andrew did in making contact after he met Jesus was he not only got hold of Peter, he told him about Jesus. He said, we have found the Messiah. When was the last time you did something that you were taught all the way through your experience in church, and I was, just simply told someone about Jesus? Who is the Messiah? Have we forgotten our ability to do that? We had an outreach emphasis last Sunday night. I was guest speaker Wednesday night. No, it was Sunday night. And he talked an hour about this, <laughs> just making personal contact, telling folks about Jesus. Do we do that anymore? Have evangelicals forgotten their ability to do that? Well, is that enough? That's evangelism, isn't it? Go get somebody and tell them about Jesus. He didn't stop there. He brought him to Jesus. He made contact. It's, it's a great thing to go visit somebody and tell them about Jesus and invite them to your Sunday school class. That's a wonderful thing. We need to do more of it. But what about saying, I'll pick you up Sunday at 930 and I'll bring you, can I pick you up and bring you to my class? He brought him to Jesus. Now that's closing the loop. That's finishing the sale. That's going the second mile or however you like to describe it. That's the behind the scenes discipleship that Andrew practiced. He went and made personal contact. He told him the good news and he said, come with me. I'm going to introduce you to Jesus. I'm going to take you to my Sunday school class. And whom did he bring? His own brother. Sometimes that's the hardest of all, isn't it? Our own family. Sometimes it's the easiest, but it certainly is where we start our own already established sphere of influence. If you study the Great Commission, where we quote, go ye therefore and teach all nations, the word go there is actually a participle. Going is a better translation. That Jesus did not so much tell them to go. They're going to go. We're all on the go. 
His command was make disciples. As you go, make disciples. We're going to go. What is your sphere of influence, your circle of friends? Are there some that don't have a church home, that don't know Christ? Begin where you are. This is what personal witness is about. Christianity is so institutionalized in many ways, churches, schools, that sometimes we institutionalize evangelism. Evangel, personal evangelism is, 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 is people to people, individuals to individuals, telling their story. Let's not forget that. We find Andrew another time in John's gospel in the sixth chapter. John chapter six, if you have your Bibles and are following, you can turn over there and just listen as I read it or tell it. Jesus went out to the other side of the Sea of Galilee the Sea of Tiberias, and a great multitude followed him because they saw the signs that he did. He went up on a mountain and sat down and taught the disciples. It was Passover time, and then it got to be dinner time. And thousands of people are hungry. And so Peter, or Jesus says to Philip, um, how are we going to pay for this food? We, we need to buy food. And Philip said, what? Why, even if we had 200 denarii, which they didn't have, even if we did have, it would only buy enough food for each one of them to get a cracker, you know, just a bite or two. So Philip says it's hope, basically says this is hopeless. We've got a problem. Well, Jesus knew they had a problem. But I want to juxtapose Philip to Andrew Philip is, is a part of the problem in that he's not offering any help at all. He's just saying it's hopeless. We got a problem. Well, we know we have a problem. Have you ever seen that in people? There's a problem, and everybody knows it, but all George knows to do is walk around and say the sky's falling. Well, we know that. Do you have any solutions? Can you be a part of a solution? So right after Philip says, this problem is hopeless, Andrew says, hey, there's a little boy here with five loaves and two fishes. Now, Andrew can count. He knows that's not much. What is that among so, such a huge problem, such a pittance? But Andrew reveals that he'd been circulating in the crowd, or he wouldn't have known that. He's been in touch with the people there. And while it may seem inadequate, he does bring something. He's ready to be a part of the solution. And not just a part of the problem that everybody there knew that they had. Now, you can apply that in almost any situation of life. It's one thing to scream, the sky is falling, especially when everybody can see that. It's another thing to bring something and say, will this help? Let's try this or that. How can I be of service? And he was of service by saying, there's a lad here that we've overlooked. What a powerful message. Some of the children's ministries that have been established in Christendom over the centuries have been titled with Andrew the disciple to children. He was in touch with this little boy. He was not overlooking this little boy. We'll go to Nada this afternoon and we often have 10 or 12 kids. Many times their parents aren't there. Many times they just drop them off so we'll babysit them for an hour or two. Where'd Amanda go? She went to help with children, but she came back in. And Amanda will help with the kids. And they'll be in tattered clothing, most of them. But it's a big reason I go to Nate. Those kids. They have potential. They have talent. I'd like to help give them some hope and some opportunity. There's a lad here. Andrew, 
in an age of the first century when children were to be seen and not heard, when, our, when they came to Jesus, sometimes the disciples would shoo him away and say he's busy. It's one of the few times Jesus became fighting mad, became angry. He said, wait a minute, suffer the little children to come unto me and forbid them not, for such is the kingdom of heaven if they come to church, whether their parents are with them or not. We've got kids all around us in this neighborhood. They move in here and out of here in waves. And yes, they're, they're less church broke, as Dad used to say, than some of our kids that were raised in church. They need more attention. It's harder to work with them. There's a lad here. There's a lass here. There are children here. Andrew was in touch with that and bears that standard before us, whether we are comfortable with it or know what to do about it or not, because he was circulating among them. It's trying to be a part of the solution. And this unlikely little boy turned out to be, surprisingly, at the center of the solution to feeding the 5,000. He who seemed to be maybe a challenge turned out to be a part of the solution. The last time we see Andrew, I don't know for sure it's the last time, but in the middle of John's gospel, in the last week of Jesus' life, John's gospel has 21 chapters, and half of them pertain only to the last week of Jesus' life. Did you know that? Passion week. Half of John has already turned to Passover week by the 11th chapter. And we dealt with this passage last week, you may recall. In chapter 12, where they're at the Passover feast, and there were certain Greeks who came to Jerusalem to worship, at the feast, and they went up to Philip, and they said, Sir, we would like to meet Jesus. Sir, we would see Jesus. I think that was the title of the message last week. And these Greeks, who were thus Gentiles, sought out a Greek disciple. Philip and Andrew had Greek names, two disciples of the Greek names. They found someone like themselves to say, We would like to see this Hebrew Messiah. Well, if you read the passage, it appears that Philip was kind of just stunned and didn't know what to do. It doesn't say that, but if you read between the lines, Philip didn't say, well, come right on, I'll take you to Jesus. No, he went and said, Andrew, what do I do? <laughs> he went and found Andrew, who had proved to be a resourceful, behind-the-scenes, legwork disciple. Maybe Andrew will know what to do. Because Philip, I'm sure, was aware that Jesus is Hebrew and these are Greeks, they're Gentiles, and we have this tension throughout the New Testament of, of Greek and Hebrew, Gentile and Jew. We're studying the book of Galatians in the evenings at church, Sunday nights and Wednesday nights, where Paul wrote the whole book of Galatians, is to try to teach the Galatians it's okay not to be Jews. It's okay not to go back and be circumcised, because some of them were trying to tell them, no, you need to become Jewish before you can become Christian. So here's Andrew realizing early on, yeah, I'll take these Greeks to see Jesus. And he did. And Jesus said, if I be lifted up, I will draw all men unto myself. All children, red and yellow, black and white, they are precious in his sight. In Christ, there's neither Jew nor Greek, male nor female, slave nor free, Jew nor Gentile. All nations, go ye therefore to all nations. And it looks like Andrew was one of the first ones to see that. And he was far more progressive than his brother Peter, if you read the New Testament history. Peter had a hard time breaking away from Judaism. He struggled with that. It took an apostle Paul to take the gospel out of Jerusalem and to the uttermost parts of the earth and fulfill the great commission. But Andrew saw it. Whosoever will may come. My father was a pastor, as, as you know, and he used to say in at the close of every service, as you leave, greet the stranger first and then your friends. Strangers, welcoming strangers, welcoming outsiders, going and getting them and bringing them to Christ, bringing them to church. It counts greatly, not only today, 
but in eternity. And in Matthew 25, it counts even in Judgment Day, apparently, for when they asked Jesus, when did we see you? And he said, come, my blessed, blessed of my Father, and enter the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was a stranger, and you took me in. May we pray. Our Father, we are reminded by this unsung hero, this background disciple, that everything that we do counts in the kingdom. Large roles are small. And that most of all, we are called to reach out to family members, but also to Greeks, to Gentiles, the world that is lost, unchurched, uninvolved in the community of faith, and perhaps unrelated to you in Jesus Christ. Commission us, we pray, through this passage to do our part, to share the soft and tender voice of Jesus that is calling all to come home. In his name we pray. Amen. Our hymn of invitation this morning as we close the service is number 312. Softly and tenderly, Jesus is calling. If you have a public decision to make about your faith, you come as we stand and sing. Wilma Early comes to reaffirm her faith publicly in Christ, and she said, I'm going to begin again, even though I'm getting closer to the end. That's what renewal is about, isn't it? Her birthday was October the 6th. Happy birthday, Wilma. Thank you. How long have you been a member of this church? This church since 48. Since 1948. That's 67 years. 67 years. <laughs> That's a long time. That's a long time. It went by fast, didn't it? Sure did. Sure did. Amazingly fast. But I started before that. You know? I was yep. at Harrodsburg for nine years. Okay. Before that. Before that. So. Well, happy birthday in Christ. Let's bow together for our closing prayer. I'll ask Judy Hicks, if you would, please, to lead us in our benediction.
Christ our Master.